there and welcome to my channel. If this is your first time here, my name is Angie and I'm a chemist who loves makeup. And today I'm going to be reacting to a podcast slash video, the Simply Pod Logical podcast, which is Simply Now Logical's Christine and her boyfriend Ben. And in this particular one, they actually talk about the testing that goes into Hollow Taco, which is their nail polish brand. So whether or not you're familiar with Christine and her nail polish, I hope that you learned something today about the testing of nail polish and overall cosmetics in general. I also love Hollow Taco, so I will link some of my favorite products below. Not sponsored, but I really admire Christina, and I really love the nail polish. In fact, I am wearing it today. Also, when I react to and comment on things, this may not be necessarily what Hollow Taco does, but this is just based on my experience as a chemist. All right, let's get into the video. Next question uh, from Caitlin Triplett. Uh, what actually goes into the testing process? I know we've seen you wearing them and also getting Ben to wear them for testing <laughs> purposes, but what happens if you reject a formula? How does that process work? Thanks for being awesome. So uh, I'm not sure how specific we want to be, but we could talk kind of generally about what, uh, what sort of testing we do and what like any nail polish company should be doing in terms of testing products. Maybe one sort of fundamental thing that isn't really testing, but is really important is just making sure whatever suppliers or vendors you're getting ingredients from, you're only getting ingredients that are uh, appropriate to use in nail polish. And you mm -hmm. have the documentation from those vendors and stuff that uh, shows exactly what it is so you know what is going into your product. That's just a super important thing and something that gives you confidence even at the very beginning stages of developing a polish formula. You already have a pretty strong idea that it's safe and fine because you're comfortable with what's going in it. So what Ben is describing is very important, especially for any brands who don't have the financial ability to do a lot of additional testing for their ingredients, which I will refer to as raw materials because that is the technical term that is used. So we will refer to ingredients as raw materials from here on out. There's a lot of vetting that has to be done when you're picking suppliers and raw materials. The suppliers will send you a C of A, which is a certificate analysis. The certificate of analysis document will contain a lot of important testing information for the raw material. For some raw materials, this could be identification testing. For identification testing, there are set testing methods that you can use to prove that this particular raw material is what it says it is. The identification testing can be something as simple as just mixing things together to make things change color, or you have to put it on some sort of instrumentation to prove this. You can also test for the purity of an ingredient, and that's also using a variety of methods. And purities are also a very important thing that is tested for and shown on the C of A as well. Certain raw materials are more prone to degrading, which could lead to harmful compounds being present in that raw material, or the way that they are made could have potential leftover solvent that could be harmful. And there's also natural impurities, things that you mine from the earth can also have things like lead. By testing for these kind of impurities, you can assure that they're, they are not present or they are in low enough amounts to be safe for a consumer to use. And based on those results, it may not be suitable for nail polish or cosmetics in general. That's why there are different grades of different raw materials. If something is not suitable, for instance, for nail polish, you might use it as like something that's used industrially. There are also sources like the CIR, which is the Cosmetic Ingredient Review Board, and that is composed of people from a variety of professions, dermatologists, toxicologists, chemists, biologists, and that group of people is separate from any government entity, and they help determine safe levels of ingredients to use in the products and impurities associated with those raw materials. And for any brands, a lot of trust does go into these raw material suppliers and it's important to vet that these suppliers are good suppliers because if their manufacturer isn't able to perform this testing in house at a low cost, it is very expensive to send out these raw materials for all these kind of tests. In terms of the kinds of tests you can do outside of like wear tests, uh, there's a few fun ones that we we're aware of now. Uh, there's a kind of oven you can buy. It's UV testing, I think. <laughs> yeah, is essentially, like used. it simulates like what would happen to a polish over time, or if it was exposed to heat or sunlight, mm -hmm. something like that. But it's essentially just a special little oven you put nail polish in, <laughs> and it's actually really useful. And it it actually has influenced the development process for us before, because there are certain kinds of pigments or colors of nail polish you could make that are more susceptible to fading than others. Mm -hmm. 
And there have been times where we're like developing and polish, and it's only after we've gone through that sort of phase of testing where we realize it fades too much and we needed to make an adjustment to the formula, mm -hmm. for example. So I guess that's one. You gotta and bake it for a you minute. You gotta bake it for more than a minute, yeah. So I believe the testing that they're talking about here is UV testing. This one in particular is to show the stability of the color of the nail polish. This one I think is specifically for light because your nail polish is in clear bottles. So it's going to be susceptible to light damage. And as things are exposed to light, the colorants can degrade, they can change color. If when you do this test, it changes color, adjustments have to be made. Either you're gonna change the colorants or there are things that are UV stabilizers like benzophenone, which will help prevent the color change from light. So they didn't mention this test, but there's also what's called flashpoint testing. And I know that this one is done on nail polish. It basically measures the temperature that your nail polish could catch on fire. Obviously you don't want this temperature to be too low, otherwise people's nail polishes are just gonna spontaneously combust. So that's a pretty fun test. And then there's also testing of just, like the real hardcore testing you would do once like, you probably do this later on because it's an expensive thing, but you can literally like send a nail polish to an independent lab mm -hmm. and they'll give you a report confirming that there isn't anything in there that shouldn't be in there. Because yeah. even if you're using a suspension base you get from a vendor you trust and you know it's safe, there's always a chance for contamination or something being in there that shouldn't be in there. So it's always a smart idea to do that sort of lab testing as mm -hmm. well. So like Ben mentioned, these tests are expensive. So you use something like an ICP, GC, MS, and it'll separate out the components and from there you can determine what the components are of your nail polish. Different spikes on these readings are associated with different compounds. And these tests are pretty expensive. These can be thousands of dollars per sample. And because these tests are so expensive, a lot of indie brands probably don't have the ability to do these kind of tests on every single nail polish. Bigger brands are gonna have the ability to be able to do this kind of testing. If you're able to do this, this is great because you can check on your suppliers. It's also really good for indie brands if they can find someone experienced in auditing to vet these suppliers as well. We have stability testing as well, which <laughs> from what I understand is like a durability test basically. <laughs> and then there's also viscosity testing, which is how thick is the nail polish? Can it run through, you know, some strain of something? And, and there's a percentage of viscosity that mm -hmm. they assign. So those are some tests you kind of do before even putting it on a nail. So what stability testing actually is, it's gonna see how this product ages over time. And it, to do this, you store this in a chamber, which is controlled for both humidity and temperature. For a new product, they'll do what is called accelerated stability testing. So in this case, you're gonna store it at elevated temperature and elevated humidity, and this is gonna simulate aging at a faster rate. You can't sit around for a year and a half to see how this product ages, so you need to do this kind of accelerated stability testing to quickly see if this is gonna be a good product or not. What can you find out during the stability testing. One is separation. Sometimes these products will separate out over time. Sometimes the texture can turn weird. Maybe it gets too thick over time. Maybe it gets thicker faster than anticipated over time. Color is also something that can change over time. So by doing this testing, you can ensure that product remains good over the course of its intended lifetime. So like Christine said, viscosity testing is to test the consistency of a product in terms of how thick it is. The most common way I've seen it done in the past is you have your vessel and you put your sample, in this case the nail polish, into the vessel. You then insert this spindle and you will make that start to spin. Based on the resistance that that spindle has when it is trying to spin will give you your viscosity. It can be in different units. One of them can be percentages, like she said, or the other common one I've seen is CPS. So the higher the percentage, the thicker it is. And there will be a specified range that this nail polish has to fall into. If it's too high of a percentage, the nail polish is gonna to be too thick, it's not gonna apply properly. If the percentage is too low, it's gonna to be too thin, and it probably won't give you enough coverage. I would just also quickly add to this question, outside of the testing of the polish itself, there's sort of QA testing that goes on more generally about, you know. Quality assurance. Yeah, making sure like the bottle caps are screwed on properly and things like that. And like, so that testing and all the testing we already described is something we sort of have done from the beginning, but I would say we've gotten 
much better and more sophisticated in how we approach all this testing over time. So I think we've definitely seen improvements in terms of, you know, like in, in any business, you're going to see a certain percentage of like orders that aren't perfectly correct, like they weren't packed exactly correct, or like mm -hmm. sometimes something's missing a sticker. And, you know, you keep metrics on this, like sort of performance metrics, just to measure how you're doing over time. And I think we've gotten better in terms of the quality and consistency of the formula as well. So QA testing is something that's going to be performed batch to batch of the nail polish. This could be on things on the actual product itself, for instance, viscosity testing, color testing, that would be done on the actual product. But in terms of the bottles and the packaging, like the cap being twisted on right or filling amounts. So you'll either have somebody that is physically on the line checking the products one by one, or you can install a system that is able to mechanically check it for you. One particular testing as well, you will also check the filled bottle weight to make sure it contains the amount that is stated on the product. Previously, I know that they have mentioned that they actually fill their bottles more than they say, that's fine as long as you hit that minimum amount i don't think any customer is going to complain about having more product and like ben mentioned that they're getting more sophisticated at this qa testing which you will over time because you'll start to learn particular things that are troublesome for you maybe it's a logo doesn't get placed right you'll either know that that's specifically what you really need to look out for or you can install mechanical means on these production lines that will help alleviate this problem. And when he talks about certain metrics, you're trying to hit a certain percentage of how many of your products are perfect. You're never gonna have 100%, maybe a sticker doesn't go on right, maybe something smeared. That's why I usually give products some grace because it's most likely to be caught, but sometimes things get missed. And when you do have problems like this, I think it is important to let customer service know because if a certain percentage of people are receiving products that are imperfect, then it is important for the company to know so they can make sure to alleviate that problem in the future. Yeah, we, we've always done QA, but here's the thing, even when I get the final uh, batch prototype, like the batch samples, I'll okay it, but then I'm not actually at the warehouse to inspect all the bottles, right? Sure. So there does need to be people on the ground who are looking at these things. Mm -hmm. So we've always done this, but it was only recently in the past few months that um, we've hired a QA specialist whose job is only to do QA as opposed to before it was like a shared responsibility of people working in the warehouse. Yeah. So I think that that's a great improvement because quality to me is so important mm -hmm. and it, it upsets me if like one thing is wrong and I, I maybe we'll get into that later but like my yeah. emotional attachment to all to you know being in, in business but yeah. um yeah quality is is paramount so i'm gonna let you on a secret those samples that she's getting sent are gonna be the perfect samples out of those batches they are being hand-picked and sent to her so that's why it's important you have your own qa people in order to inspect the bottles but they have their own people in their own warehouse that are doing inspections in the warehouse if you're checking products in a warehouse situation you'll usually pull out a random bottle off of different pallets you can't just check one pallet either the first or the last pallet because something could happen halfway through that caused quality issues so i'm really happy christine mentioned they hired someone who is a qa specialist Again, bigger brands have their own quality departments that deal with all this stuff. But for an indie brand, I have noticed a lot of them don't have someone who's dedicated to quality. Like she said, it was a shared responsibility before. So somebody whose background is in quality will know what to look for, will know, will also probably know how to help vet suppliers. So this person is an asset, especially the way that Christine talks about quality being important to her. And I think her attitude of quality being important is a great one to have and I hope that she continues it because if you have great quality products, people are gonna keep coming back. So I hope you enjoy this. I'm really glad they are able to give us a behind the scenes look in terms of testing of their products. So if you want Christine and Ben to see this, maybe, you know, share it on Twitter, Instagram, tag them, you know, if, if, if you want to. But if you learned something today, give this video a like. And if you want to learn more about the science behind your makeup and skincare, don't forget to click the subscribe button. And with that, I will see you in my next video.